Let's bow our heads. I'm going to pray for us out loud. You pray silently. Let's pray. God, we're really here today because we believe it's the best thing for us. We're not here today mostly uh, out of guilt or obligation. I mean, that may be a little bit of it, but, but mostly we're here really because we believe that your words bring life. And so we're not, we're not here today um, because of any one preacher, any one song, or any one... We're, just, we're mostly here because we, we believe we can, we can hear from you. We've come here believing that we can hear from you. And so that's what we want. We want you to settle the noise in our hearts, the noise that we've brought with us. Would you settle that? It's not, it's not an important, but it's a distraction. Would you quiet the noise in our hearts? That we might hear, that we, that we might hear directly from you. And God is the preacher. I ask that you would, you would speak through me. In a prophetic sense, you would you would give me words that I don't even have yet. I mean, I've I've worked hard on this, but would you would you speak directly through me today? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Move among us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, greetings, River Church. This is, uh, I only know this because I keep track of it uh, every week. I write it down. This is week 14 in uh, the study of Matthew. And it's a significant week, uh, not because it's the 14th week in which we've studied the book of Matthew, but it is, uh, it is a Significant week because it is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, which is arguably the most uh, famous passage of Scripture in the entire Bible. Um, so today we, we hear Jesus' final words, His last words in the Sermon on the Mount. And an older gentleman, a mentor of mine, used to always say, Randy, Last words are lasting words. And I never knew quite what that meant. But at least I knew that it meant that whatever you say at the end, like that ought to be important. That ought to really, like, you got to land the plane. And so that's what we're looking at today. Jesus' final words in the Sermon on the Mount. If we, if we, uh, it, it's Matthew chapter 7 the middle of Matthew chapter 7, but if, you, if we just review, just for a moment, I was doing this early this morning, and I was thinking about what have what we really looked at? Because, you know, some of you listen super passively, meaning you, you don't listen. Uh, some of you listen to the sermon somewhat actively, uh, and then a few of you are like students, and like, you correct me when I'm wrong, you know. Uh, but, but the but, I mean, it's been, it's been months of us studying this, and so it's easy to forget as we've looked at verse upon verse upon verse, like what Jesus said. And so if I just turn, I, it starts in Matthew 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and He sat down, and His disciples came to Him, and He opened His mouth, and He taught them, saying. And then if you look through, we've got the Beatitudes, which are... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they get the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. The meek, they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will actually truly find satisfaction, which I would say is like one of the main pursuits that all of us have in life. And Jesus said that the righteous are the ones who will find satisfaction. Blessed are the merciful, they receive mercy, and on and on. And then he talks about um, how he, Jesus, didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in because it was just last week, but 
But if you recall, Jesus last week said, said all of the law and the prophets can be summed up in this one statement. Treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated. And, I, and we kind of, I didn't gloss over that. I tried to put a lot of weight on that last week, but it, we, we tend to gloss over that as evangelical Christians. Like that's just one thing Jesus said. But, but last week, Jesus said, I'm going to sum up all of the revealed will of God. Because all they had at that point was the New Testament. I mean, the Old Testament. And so, so another way of saying, Jesus said, let me, let me, um, let me summarize the entire revealed will of, of, our, of my Heavenly Father. And then he, of all the things that he could possibly have said, he said, treat your neighbor or your brother the way you want to. The things that you wish people would do for you, do those things. The, the things that you wish people wouldn't do to you anymore, don't do those things. And Jesus said, there you go. That is the revealed will of God. That, that's a sermon I preached last week, so I'm not going to go back there. But it's astounding that Jesus makes that one statement and says, this is the revealed will of God. And then in chapter, I think, 22, we'll get there in like 2024. In chapter, 20, 20, in, in chapter 22 of Matthew, he says it again. He says, uh, the, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, love your neighbor as yourself. Anyway, going back into the, uh, this, this review of of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. How does he fulfill it? I think in his teaching of how we are to treat our neighbors ourselves. He talks about anger where he says, like, you, you've been told, like, don't murder. And whoever murders will be liable for judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother is liable for judgment. He goes on, you've heard, you shall not commit adultery, but I say, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in his heart. And, and so he just raises in the bar, right? He talks about, about retaliation. He says, you've heard an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you to turn the other cheek. When someone wants a piece of you, give them a second shot. Um, he talks about loving your enemies. He talks about, about, about distributing your wealth in the direction of the poor and the needy. All these, all these teachings that, I mean, quite frankly, I think the, the, the evangelical church at times just like totally forgets or glosses over. He teaches us how to pray. He teaches us about fasting. He teaches us about the laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. He talks about anxiety and judging others and on and on with the Sermon on the Mount. A little more summary. Behind this idea, behind all these ideas, there's this, there are these, these two, he, 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 go, he runs on these this, this like two tracks where he'll give you option A and option B. Option A and option B. And I don't know if you've picked up on this throughout the Sermon on the Mount over the last 14 weeks, but, but um, he says, like, for instance, there are two treasures which every one of us in this room is seeking after. There's earthly treasure and then there is heavenly treasure. And behind that idea, he says there are two visions. Like we fix our eyes on the stuff of earth, or we fix our eyes on eternity. Two visions. And he says behind that, there's this idea of two masters. Remember, he says you can either serve God or you can serve money, but you cannot be owned by both. Either God will own you or your money will own you. And behind that, uh, it leads to this ultimate theme, really, the theme throughout the book of Matthew, which is there are these there are two kingdoms, right? There is the, 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 the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the earth, which most of us live in most of the time, and then there's the kingdom of heaven, which is accessible to us now. We can now live in it because it's not a place it's a realm, but it's not a place. The kingdom of heaven, the upside down kingdom of heaven, which is contrary and a contrast to the, the kingdom of earth that most of us spend most of our time in. And then again, these, this idea of option A or option B, he says that there are, there are two measures with which we judge one another. You can either judge others uh, with justice 
and then you too should expect to be uh, judged by that bar, that standard. Or you can judge other people mercifully, and then you too will be judged by that standard. As I said, two ways of treating one, treating others, and that's verse twelve. So in everything, this last week. So in everything, you. Uh, in it, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law. And the prophets. And then finally today, two final sort of options, option A and option B, that we're going to look at for the rest of the day. He says that there are two paths. Two paths. And you get to choose, choose which, on which path um, your life will reside, you get to choose which path to take. Jesus says that there are two paths. There is a path that leads to destruction. And that's a, that's a heavy word, but Jesus speaks in very heavy terms here as he wraps up the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you can choose the path that leads to destruction, or you can choose the path that leads to life. And with that, he, in, he ends this, this sermon on the mount. So let's look at the last words of Jesus today. What does he say in wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount? He gives us actually four warnings. Four warnings. And so we're going to break them up. Each screen is the next warning, and the next warning. Let's, let's jump right in. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Warning number two. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are, they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do, uh, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their, the, this is the false prophets, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Warning number three. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And then the last warning. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. He finishes his sermon on the mount. 
And Matthew tells us, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, there are four sections for for warnings. Here we go. Section number one, summary number one. Life is not found in following the crowd. Jesus says, life is not found in following the crowd. It's hard for me to even say that, but, but or it's hard for me to say what I'm about to say, rather. But what Jesus is saying is that true discipleship is a minority position to take. True discipleship is not a crowded location. And true discipleship, really following Jesus, involves costly decisions. Listen to me, friends. Many of us are taking life according to the path of least resistance. That is how we approach religion. That is how we approach spirituality. That is how we approach Jesus. That is how we approach life. That's how we approach the body of Christ. The path of least resistance. The least that I can do, the least committed that I can be. That is how we view missions. The the planting of churches globally is we take the path of least resistance. That is how we approach evangelism in our own personal relationships. That is how we approach obedience to the teachings of Jesus. The path of least resistance. And Jesus says that true discipleship is a minority position to take. Few people really walk that path. He's saying the way to destruction, Jesus' words, is a roomy path. And the way to life is a very restricted path. I'm going to reference Eugene Peterson a few times today because he so aptly and poetically paraphrases what Jesus is saying. Listen to what he says. He says, The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for all that stuff. Even though crowds of people do. The way to life, the way to God, is vigorous and requires your total attention. The section number one, Jesus is saying, life is not found in following the crowd. Section number two, summary. False teachers... (laughs) offer an easier alternative to the narrow way of discipleship. I hope you have your Bible today because we're not going to keep going back and forth on the screen. But let me just remind you, he said this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Again, this warning number two is that false teachers offer an easier alternative to the narrow way of discipleship. What Jesus seems to be saying is that when a false teacher teaches falsely, his teaching or her teaching seems plausible. It's not just outright gibberish. It seems 
like it might work. But in the end, it rings hollow. It may not ring hollow in the beginning, but in the end it rings hollow, ultimately. And Jesus seems to be saying that, that the false teacher's teaching <clears throat> is false because they neither acknowledge nor teach the narrow way that leads to life. They, they teach, a, teach a much broader way. And how? The answer is in Jesus' teaching. How do you know if a person is a false teacher? How do you, how do you test them? Well, what Jesus says, interestingly, part of me is like, I'm not even sure I agree with this, but it's Jesus. Jesus says, so you should go with Jesus' answer. Jesus says, the test is not doctrinal, in nature, but is rather ethical. In other words, ultimately you will know them by their fruit. Fruit is a metaphor for how the teacher is living his life ethically. How, he's, how his life, how his actual life lines up with the ethic of Jesus. Eugene Peterson says it this way. <clears throat> Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. As your pastor is the, is, is, is the man who mostly preaches from this pulpit into your life. I'm not the only one, but the one who does it most often. My goal is for you to think for yourself. My, my goal is for you to think for yourself re regarding God and the Bible and devotion to Christ and ethics and lifestyle I feel like I succeed if I lead you to walk out of here and think for yourself and study Scripture for yourself. Jesus says, that false teachers offer an easier alternative to the narrow way of discipleship. Section number three, here's the warning of Jesus. There are many who are self-deceived regarding their spiritual health. Jesus is saying that there are many, which if, if we're just practically honest, would have to mean some of us in this room. Right? I mean, that's just logical. Jesus is saying that there are many who think falsely for a lifetime that they are on the path that leads to life. When in fact, in reality, for a lifetime, they're on a path that leads to destruction. He says, many will call me Lord, and many will claim to have done great spiritual things, like hearing and prophecy, and he doesn't even seem to challenge, number one, the authenticity of at least their belief. Like, they really genuinely believe that they're on the path to life. And number two, he doesn't even seem to challenge the authenticity of these things that, that they claim to have done. What, I, what I'm saying is, it, it seems as though Jesus is painting a picture as though there are people that really, they really, they really do believe that, that Jesus is their Lord. And they really do believe that they've been doing the stuff for Jesus. 
That's a little John Wimber's phrase, doing the stuff. Um, and Jesus says, but who will actually enter the kingdom? He says, those who do the will of the Father. Jesus says, not merely those who, not, not, not merely those who call me Lord, this seems to imply that there is genuine self-deception going on. I mean, like the, the false disciple genuinely thinks that he is on, genuinely thinks that she is on the narrow path. When in fact, in reality, the whole time he or she is on the broad, the wide path, but thinking that they're on the right path. True discipleship is tied to the ethic of Christ found in this entire Sermon on the Mount that we've looked at over the last 14 weeks. It's also interesting to notice in this passage that, that Jesus, He's turning up, turning up the heat here. He presents Himself as the ultimate and final judge. If you're looking, if you're if you're a skeptic, number one, I, I love I love you. I love skeptics. I love people that are like leaning in, but also have a lot of questions. I'm leaning in, but I got a lot of questions. Right? I'm leaning in the right direction. I'm leaning in to the to the body of Christ. I'm leaning into scriptures, but I got a lot of questions. If that's you, here is yet again another example of Jesus claiming his deity, claiming to be God. He boldly claims it here. Verse 23, it says, Then I will tell you plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. He's not saying, God one day is going to judge you. God one day, here's the word, he's saying, I'm going to be there on that final day. And this is tragically, if you don't get yourself on the narrow path, this is, Jesus says, what I will say, because I, in fact, Am your Savior, am your, lo- your Lord, am your judge. I'm God. I would, I, would, I would go as far as to say this. Jesus alone decides who enters the kingdom on the last day. And Jesus alone decides who is, who is banished from His presence on the last day. It's a sobering thought. A person can come so close to spiritual reality and yet know nothing of its fundamental reality. It's a scary thought. And in the final warning, section number four, summary number four, everyone hears Jesus' words, but only a few obey his words. And Jesus starts talking about building the life. Like it's like you're building a structure, like you're building a house. I think we kind of like that. I think we kind of see our lives as that, like brick upon brick. I'm building whatever you're going to call it, building a legacy. I'm building a life for myself. I'm building a family. I'm sinking down roots. And Jesus says here that building a life is actually a lifetime achievement. It's not done in a day. It's not done in a year. And so building a life is like building a house. It's a metaphor, like any metaphor. If you press it too hard, it'll break. But, but what Jesus is saying is that, that there are two types. When you're, building, when you're building a structure, Jesus, there are more than two types, but Jesus gives us at least two types of foundation for the sake of this, of this story. He gives us two different types of foundation, two different types 
of structures you can build. But the only difference is the foundation. And Jesus is, seems to be saying, it is your choice. You can choose here. Just like you can choose a path that leads to destruction or a path that leads to life. You, can, you, you build your life. There are two types of foundation. You build on one or you build on the other. It is your choice. This is actually, uh, you're probably aware of, that this is actually one of the most well-known metaphors of all of Jesus' teaching throughout, throughout the Gospels. This is probably, it's one of, if not the most well-known metaphor. He talks about the wise builder, and he talks about the foolish builder, and he would say to us today, every one of us in this room, you are a wise builder as you're building your life, as you're... As you're Setting the course, you're either a wise builder or you're a foolish builder. For the wise builder, the one who built his house on the foundation of stone, said the rains came and the stream rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. This, this whole final section, this whole final section um, begins with verse 24, begins with the word, therefore. He's starting to land the plane, he's coming on the runway, he says, therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine, puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Therefore, verse 24 begins with therefore. And what he's saying is, in light of the fact, therefore is referencing what he just said, in light of the fact that there are many who are self-deceived regarding their spiritual condition, in light of that fact, he's already told you that, 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 that it's potentially numbers of us in this room potentially are self deceived regarding our spiritual condition. He says, in light of that, there are two types of builders in their houses. And here's what's crazy. Each house looks secure in fair weather. They look the same in fair weather. Only storms reveal the quality of the construction of the building. Only the storms in your life reveal the quality of the construction of your life. So in the last 10 years, if you have gone through the storm and Jesus has carried you through, then guess what? That is probably great evidence that you are building your house, your life, on the rock of Jesus Christ. And if you in the last 10 years or in the last 10 minutes have gone through a storm and you feel shaken and frazzled and maybe things are coming unraveled, Jesus would say, take a look at this foundation. And that is not a judgmental statement. This is a very life-giving topic that we are about to tease out here for the next five minutes or so. On which foundation are you building your life? I want you to listen to me here. This is a, this is a dire war, warning you need to heed the words of Jesus. Both builders hear Jesus' words. They, 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 they hear everything that he has to say. But only one of them responds. What are you doing to build a life worth being proud of in the end? 
this metaphor of, of, of a few builders, Jesus, uh, it, it, it's told again in, in another gospel in Luke 7. So I'm going to look at this one as well. Luke 7. Should be the next. Did it not make it in? Luke 7, verse 47. I'll read it to you. He says it this way in, in Luke 7. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck. It struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. Let's talk about building your life on a solid rock, what does that even mean? What, what could that possibly mean? In your life, in my life, in every one of all of us as adults, and the, the children here will, will soon be adults, and, and the truth is, for every one of us, the flood will come. The wind will bash against your house. The tide will flow against the grain, and you will be made deeply uncomfortable in life, deeply sorrowful in life. For some of us, it's come in the last few years. And, and, and sadly, we older Christians... We older Christians, the, evan the evangelical church in the last decade, more so than ever in my lifetime, we've made the teachings of Jesus a silly, a silly mockery of what it was intended to be. And we've given our younger people peripheral issues to, to chase after, We've, we, we, we've, we've, we've turned the teachings of Jesus into silly counterpoints politically. We, we've, we've turned it into silly political arguments and religious nationalism and, and, and knee-jerk reactions to what we thought the world was doing. And we've made... And, and there's a reason why I'm saying this. We've, we've made really a mockery of what this foundation that Jesus speaks of ought to be. And I'll say in the last 9 to 12 months, sort of like the post-COVID era and the post-election era, still kind of shell-shocked, still kind of coming off of all that. I have, I have talked to, personally, at least a handful, personally, at least a handful, no, what's that, five? At least a handful of young adults who are, who are, who are rightfully questioned, and this is a good thing, because Jesus says, take stock. What are you building your house on? Who, who, have, who have rightfully questioned some of what us older evangelicals are calling Christianity. Or, or, or calling like this is the bedrock foundation of who we are, what we believe. This is Christianity. Build your house on this. We as as older evangelicals, and there aren't many of us in this room, most of us are younger, but we as older, we, we, have, we have presented something as bedrock, which is not bedrock. And so I've talked to this at least handful personally, like one-on-one -on -one conversation, at least handful of young adults who are at their wits' end. What I'm saying is how every one of us in this room, younger evangelicals, 
older evangelicals. Let's just call us Christians. <clears throat> how we have been building a foundation determines how we are going to get through the rest of our lives and how we are going to ultimately finish well. Now, I've picked on people like me a little bit. Let me pick on you as millennials a lot, okay? What Jesus is saying is that just asking questions and just playing around with your spirituality on your spare time is not enough. Taking the, 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 the broad road of deconstructionism or, or just, just merely, you know, on your, when, you, when you have a little bit of time, just sort of throwing stones and taking shots, that's not enough. Jesus is saying, forget what, you know, to, to, to throw my own stone, Forget what the Faldwells tell you. Forget what the, the, the secular evangelical world tells you. Forget, like, just come back to the teachings. of What is Jesus telling you? Are you taking that seriously? Are you just playing around? Jesus said a life well spent is a life determining what is the foundation, the rock that Jesus has. Start with the Sermon on the Mount, if you will. What is the foundation? What will I build my life? Don't be distracted by what other people are doing. What are you doing with your life? Is Jesus real for you? And if he is, then get serious about what he teaches. Not what I teach, what Jesus says. And then the final conclusion is this. The final conclusion is that the crowd, they're astonished. Right? Remember that? It said, I'll, I'll read it to you one more time. It said that when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. The crowd was astonished, not so much by the content of his teaching, but by the presence of his authority. If you're a skeptic today, I already told you, I, I love you dearly. If you're a skeptic today, what you have to be confronted with is Jesus' authority or his lack thereof. If Jesus is really who he says he is, the, 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 the God-man who changed history like none other. I mean, that's undeniable. Wars have been fought in his name. The calendar reflects his, <clears throat> his existence. Three or four great religions somehow loosely revolve around his story. He's a game changer like no other human that has walked this earth. What we are confronted with today is what the crowd is astonished by. This guy isn't just a great teacher. His words aren't just awesome. He speaks with authority. And if that's true, then I invite you to just go all the way back to the beginning and say, okay, what's the foundation? What's Jesus saying? I want to build my life on that. Jesus' upside-down kingdom that we've been talking about over the last 14 weeks, his upside-down kingdom ethic is authenticated by his divinity, the fact that he's God. It's authenticated. It's validated, verified, certified, endorsed, substantiated by his divinity. If he is not God, then he has no authority, and therefore this upside-down kingdom ethic that he presents holds little credibility. It's not authenticated, and yet, unless it's authenticated by his divinity. 
So Jesus is no ordinary prophet. He speaks in first person. He says that he's come to fulfill the Old Testament. He says that he alone determines who enters the kingdom on the last day and who doesn't enter the kingdom on the last day. So for every one of us, every one of us in this room today, the, 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 the young, because the young, there's some young kids in here, those of us that are old and getting older, the millennials in this room, the teenagers in this room, every one of us in this room today, we should feel compelled to go back to the beginning. So, okay, what, what's foundational here? I want to I wanna, I wanna build my life on that. May it be. Amen. Would you bow with me? I'm, I'm thinking right now of the story when, when Peter, the apostle, was confronted, confronted by Jesus himself. <laughs> Jesus had just made some hard statements, which he was prone to do, and his his disciples were leaving him and things were, things were getting hard in his ministry. This was just prior to him going to the cross. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, will you leave me too? Will you walk away also? And Peter says to Jesus, where else would I go? You alone hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus, we pray to you today saying that, that, that amidst all of the all of the questions that all of the questions that are that are that are so prevalent today and all of the unanswered questions that we have regarding who you are and how we're supposed to live this Christian life. Among all that, we, what we want to say is that the foundation, the very depth of our hearts is this sense of you alone, Jesus, you alone hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have no other hope but you. We have no other hope but you. And so we, we want to lean into you, Jesus. We want to hear from you. And we want to be taught by you. And, and this is a serious topic. We want the foundation of our lives to be you, Jesus. May it be.